Good evening and welcome to a special talk with a highly distinguished guest, Mr. Nigel Tallis. Mr. Tallis is the curator of the Middle East Department at the, at the British Museum. He is an expert on Mesopotamia with a special interest in wheeled vehicles and transport systems. One of the most important technological achievements of early civilization was the development of wheeled transport by our Iraqi ancestors some 5,000 years ago. Mr. Talis studied archaeology and ancient history at the University of Birmingham. He tells me that he was always fascinated by the art of Mesopotamia. He wanted to know who made those beautiful objects, bowls, crowns, jewelry, and so on. Mr. Tallis has been giving lectures and talks in the UK and around the world about Mesopotamian subjects and objects. He has just returned recently from Norway, where he gave a talk of this kind. He is the co-author of books on the Beluat Gates of King Ashur Nasser II of Assyria. He curated exhibitions which have included Mesopotamian subjects and material in the UK, in Spain, and in Abu Dhabi. He is currently working on a new project, uh, the publication of the Nimrud Bronze Bowls. These bowls were found at around 1850, um, and they are from, made of bronze, and some of them have gold and silver on them and they are about 2,900 years old. Tonight, he will be looking at wheeled vehicles in Mesopotamian art, in literature, and in mythology. From the time they were invented 5,000 years ago until the time of Alexander in the 4th century BC before Christ, I am informed by insiders at the British Museum that Mr. Tallis is an authority in the field of early chariots and that he is well placed indeed to talk to us about it tonight. So please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Nigel Tallis, the gentleman who is taking care of our history at the British Museum. Thank you. Here well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, um, and it, it, it really is a very great pleasure to be here and to see so many people here um, tonight. Um, as has been said, I I have particular interest in now, wheel transport, wheel. and I've studied is a history, history of archaeology of the Iraq and my professional and life, and uh, and, uh, and when I was a child, I read what books I could on this subject. There weren't very many at that time. And it is such a thrill to be here and to be able to talk to you about the subject tonight. Um, well, first of all, um, who invents things? When are things invented? Um, and who invented the plow? Who first put a stick into the ground? Um, who invented the first, um, first boot? Um, um, this, who invented the first wheel? The, 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 the truth is we don't know exactly um, where or when the wheel was invented because it is one of those inventions which transforms everything. It's so important and it's so immediately obvious that it's important um, that the, spree, the speed of transfer of this knowledge is very quick. You must imagine that the knowledge of the wheel, once somebody had thought of it, within a generation would have spread far and wide. It's so useful. So now it's very, very hard to say exactly where and when. Was it in, on the steppes of southern Russia? Was it in Iraq? We don't know exactly. What we can say for certain, um, but the horse is um, not king. Is that the, uh, 
earlier. Um, developed. I said earlier that I uh, know that we're not very good. Um, and really its development to its fullest potential and the most technological interest seems to be in ancient Iraq, southern Iraq, um, uh, what was then known as Sumer. Um, this map which I have here, um, right at the top you can see this band of colour which shows the western steppe and Kazakhstan is shown up there. Um, that's where the horse was probably domesticated about 3,500 BC, 4,000 BC, something like that. So 5,000 to 6,000 years ago. Um, but the wheel itself, um, we know it from the third millennium BC. It must have been invented much earlier than that. Um, but there are difficulties interpreting the evidence. Making these things now, we've forgotten. Had. We don't um, have in the middle of the map because this is one of the ones I held at that time. Of course, um, we have Mesopotamia. That's the land between the two rivers, um, um, substantially now it's modern Iraq. Um, you can see at the south, at the head of the Gulf, you have Ur and Kish and the other great cities of Sumer. <laughs> Now, in these early civilizations, um, they didn't have the horse. The horse wasn't introduced to Mesopotamia until around 2300 BC. Well, what do you do in a civilization where you don't have the horse? Um, well, of course, you use other animals. And this is the wonderful and amazing thing here. Um, this vase, um, Prokofalchi, is um, a to two-period. It's Sumerian, it, it dates from about 2800 BC, and the decoration isn't very clear now, but there's a drawing to the side of it, and you can see on this drawing, it's a wheeled vehicle. And there are four animals pulling this vehicle. There are two people in the vehicle. One is in front of the other, shown much larger, so presumably much more important than the person standing behind. And the person standing behind is holding a stick or, or some reins. Um, this is the earliest representation of this type of wheeled vehicle that we know. And if you look at the wheels, they have serrated edges to them. And before I move on, I just want to point out there are four animals pulling this vehicle. And these animals aren't horses, they're donkeys. This is what you do, um, and the horse has been introduced, but an animal very like the horse is being used for all those purposes that horses were later used for. Um, and what's more than that, um, as we'll see later, the technology that is being used is either invented locally or it's adaptations of other technology. Um, earlier technology being invented to use the donkey, and it's then modified to use the horse. But this is already a very sophisticated vehicle. We'll see in a moment how sophisticated this vehicle is. Um, this is about 2800 BC. It cannot be the first appearance of this sort of vehicle. It must have had a much longer history. We just don't have it. Illustrated. Stick. Now it used to be thought um, that we could trace the evolution of these vehicles from signs on clay tablets. Writing was invented in Mesopotamia um, shortly before this vase was made, one of the great inventions of the world. Um, and in this writing system, there is a, there's a, a sign like a sledge, which early um, scholars thought, um, with two circles often below it, and scholars thought, well, this is a a development of a sledge, and you put wheels under it, and it shows how this vehicle's evolved. We now think that sign actually is a symbol, yeah. and it's a symbol for worker. And, these, and the circles underneath are numerals. So it doesn't show a vehicle, it just says there are 20 workers, or, or something like that. So this is artwork we've been looking at. What is the reality? What, what is in the real world? And um, this is a drawing of a find from a, an excavation at Kish in, in southern Iraq um, in the 1920s. Now, 
These vehicles are made of wood, and all the wood has vanished, of course, over the hundreds of years they've been buried. So all the archaeologists found were the nails around the edge of the wheel, and the impressions in the soil of the wheels. That's all they found. So if we look back at the artwork with the serrated edge, they're representing those nails in the wheel, and they presumably held on a leather tire, which hasn't survived. Well, this isn't very much to go on, is it? We have a, a sketchy drawing, and, and we have impressions in the soil. Um, what more do we know about these vehicles? Um, well, we know a lot more, <laughs> a tremendous amount more, both from archaeology and, and from art. Um, this is um, a work of art from Orr, of about 2600 BC, about 200 years later than the pot we first seen. Um, it's called the Standard of Ur by the archaeologist Sir Leonard Woolley, who found it um, again in the 1920s um, in an excavation um, he directed on behalf of the British Museum and the University of Philadelphia. Um, this particular work is in the British Museum, and um, other finds are split between Baghdad Museum and, and Philadelphia. We don't know what this object is. It's a beautiful work of art, we don't know what its function was. Um, one day we'll find out, and if anyone has any ideas, we'll, perhaps we'll, we'll throw that into the pot as well. Um, but there are two main sides of this object, and it's decorated with narrative scenes, with pictures, one side shows scenes of warfare, and the other side shows scenes of peace. And we'll, we'll look at the other side in a moment. And you see a major feature of this side, the side of war, is the result of a battle. And at the bottom, the lowest register, we have beautiful representations of vehicles. And they're shown, they're made out of shell, and the blue is lapis lazuli, which came from Afghanistan. Um, stone and it's all inlaid in bitumen on what was a wooden box. Um, conceptually it's fascinating because um, if you look at the top row you'll see that there's one figure larger than all the others standing in the middle, a man with a spear. He's literally the big man. Now he's the king. Um, the prisoners, the enemy prisoners, are being brought to him by the victorious army of all. Behind him are his officers and generals. And then what do we have behind them? His chariot, his vehicle. Now, the interesting thing about this, of course, is that, I mean, animals, draft animals like this, have been our companions in civilization for over 5,000 years. If anyone needed to travel faster than human pace on land before the invention of the steam locomotive, it had to be by using an animal, animal string. It was eventually by the horse, but before that, in Iraq, it was with the donkey. Ownership of these animals gave power, the power of movement, of communication, transport. This material came from Afghanistan that this object is made from, and of conquest. So these animals were the prime engines of transport and warfare on land. The donkey for many hundreds of years, and then the horse for the entire recorded span of human history. And yet, in this ancient artwork, we have all those aspects of art which we see through the ages. We see the great ruler, who is shown larger than everyone else, associated with animals, with his chariot, with his car, with his whatever. Um, and you have a scene of victory. And what is the engine of victory here, 2600 BC? It's this vehicle here, this early chariot. Um, interestingly, they have four wheels. And these wheels are solid. Now you might think that this is quite primitive technology. A solid wheel perhaps isn't very exciting. But then look at them more closely. They're not a solid plank of wood. Each wheel is made from three planks of wood, 
and each is very carefully shaped, you'll see they're actually crescent shaped and the centerpiece is rather like an eye. And these are bound together with straps of some sort, perhaps bronze, perhaps leather. Now the reason that they're made out of three pieces is that you can have a larger wheel than you can simply from one plank wheel. It means the wheel is very much stronger because the stresses are distributed throughout the wheel um, in a more equal way. Um, and it means that because it's larger, the vehicle can be faster, and because it's stronger, it can take more punishment. And again, this is a mature technology. Somebody didn't invent this the day before the artist made this piece. Um, it was already ancient by the time this work of art was made. Um, and again, from a point of view of art history, this is fascinating, this vehicle, because we're seeing both the side and the front of the vehicle at the same time. The artist wants us to see the whole object is struggling with perspective. So what he's done, this is, the, this is the front, and he's rotated it for 90 degrees. This is the side. <coughs> the plain parts of the vehicle, we must imagine a wood, and the red filling is leather, presumably filling. Um, when the actual vehicles were found in excavations at all, um, there was wicker work, panelling, possibly, behind this infill. Um, now there's something, again, quite unusual. If you look at the man who's sitting, the man here, he's sitting down. Because if you look at the vehicles in front, where they're galloping, here the donkeys are walking, they're standing up. So this tells us there's a seat in this vehicle. And that's very interesting. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, on the front, there's a quiver with javelins in it. And javelins of exactly this type were found at all as well. Um, um, this is one of the graves in the Royal Cemetery at all. And we can see here that there are actually two vehicles buried in the grave. Not only are there two vehicles, um, but they're different sorts of vehicle. One is large and one is much smaller. And what I suspect is the large vehicle is a wagon, which will be used for transport, and it's the smaller vehicle, which is this chariot with the seat in it, that we've seen before. Now, if it's a so already wheel, there's a differentiation. There is a type of table being used for specific purposes. And it's going fast. This was a, a, a royal tomb. Soldiers were buried on the ramp. The servants went into the tomb um, with their dead ruler, wearing all the equipment, which you can actually see on the artwork, the standard of all. This is important because it means this work isn't a fantasy. It was a representation of reality. Now, it's a Sumerian reality. It's showing victory, ever, vit ever victorious army. But it's not imagination. It, it's, yeah, it's real. Sure. Now, it's a spoke wheel. Um, and this was an artist in the Illustrated London News at the time, how he imagined this scene in the tomb. The king has been buried in the dome tomb behind, in the great pit cut into the earth. And the soldiers and the servants are waiting down there. And the vehicles have been brought down. But amazingly, the animals were sacrificed too. But they weren't donkeys. They were oxen. And we have the bones. We have some of these bones in the museum. And they're oxen. Presumably because the donkeys are too valuable. And it's very difficult to control. If you've ever worked with a donkey, you'll know they don't like doing things they don't want to do. They wouldn't have gone down in that pit, probably. Um, and this is um, an object from the another one is now tombs from the Royal Cemetery of the same date. Um, I said earlier so that I know that we're not very good at it. And it's from the grave of the Queen called Puabi. Um, Puabi is a name which means the face of her father, so she looked like her father. And this was from a vehicle buried in, in 
her tomb. And it's just superb. It's a, a silver ring, double ring, with a gold, an electrum, gold donkey on the top of it. The donkey is important because, of course, it's this great animal of, of prestige. Um, and is this ring real? Well, of course, if you look at the standard of all, what can you see? There. And this is how it functions. The reins go through. They're divided in each ring so they don't get tangled up. And they go to a ring in the nose of the donkey. Now this it's is fascinating is now because this is we not don't have this a technology anymore. because this is one of the ones I you use with donkeys. It's a technology you use with oxen and cattle, the nose ring. They're using again ancient technology which they've modified for this new use, this new animal. So you can see almost the evolution of this type of vehicle preserved. This is a fossil, this is an old way of using this vehicle. Um, so I mean, it's just a, a splendid thing. The artworks which accompany this uh, barrel are uh, just superb. Um, so yes, you see in more detail the, the ring which goes in the nose of the animal. Um, it's wearing a, a band on the chest with plumes. They're either decorative or protective. Um, now what I want you to think about here is imagine what went into making each one of these Kazakhstan It's not just a series of planks. It's wood and it's leather um, and it's metal. These are very complicated constructions. Skilled craftsmen made these vehicles. Now I know personally that skilled craftsmen make these vehicles because I've tried to make similar ones today and we're not very good at it. So the people who made these did not throw them together. These are the pinnacle, really, of types of technology at that time. But they're all sorts of different technology. It's not the invention of the wheel, you notice. It's not the invention of draft, how you control animals. It's not the invention of the smelting of metal. It's putting all these things together. Now, you can do that in a settled civilization where you can have specialized labor supported by other workers, by farmers, um, working on these different things. And we know from the texts that have been found, the writings, um, there was a complex administration. There was a bureaucracy. All these animals were noted. They were owned, they had to be fed, they took all sorts of care and attention. This is why it's in a civilization such as Sumer that you see this vehicle reaching this peak, and in quite large numbers. We know from texts that there was a unit of 60 of these vehicles in at least one battle. This isn't um, small-scale um, technology. This is a major um, achievement. Now, I said that the wheel functions in transport and trade as well, but mostly short distance trade at this time because you really need roads for wheel transport or at least flat land. What do you do when you don't have a stick, a rose? Well, if you see the bottom register, this is the peace side of the standard. You can see everyone's having a feast up at the top with music and a singer. I mean, what else is civilization but, um, but a party with music? And this figure, he's got a backpack. If anyone's had to use a backpack or a haversack, it's actually a framed backpack. We didn't reinvent this for another few thousand years, but they were using it then. That's how you carry um, trade objects, objects over very long distances. And, and with donkeys, you can see donkeys being brought in as well. Now, travel is one of the defining features of human development. Um, we move around. Humans move around, we move huge distances, unlike most other um, creatures on this planet. And entire peoples and cultures have been characterized by transport, by movement, by the donkey, by the horse. And these all have a central role in society, in peace and war, in mythology, and in literature. Now, what about other sorts of vehicle? Um, well, you must tell me when I'm sure. Yes, sure. Take your time. Um, these are four-wheeled vehicles we've looked at so far. Now, there's another type of vehicle which existed at exactly the same time. You don't see them as much, um, but they have two wheels. They're lighter. 
and we must presume they moved much faster. But they couldn't carry the other person in them. So they're probably fast transport messengers used them or, or other people. Um, this is a little clay model. You find them in huge numbers in sites in southern Iraq. There must have been, um, they're, they're, they're votive in dedications and temples or their toys. Um, and the other item is this wonderful bronze model, um, which again shows the four donkeys pulling this type of vehicle and the rider sitting astride, rather like a motorbike in this case. You might see the runabouts, the young men running around town in, in these vehicles. Um, but then around 2000 BC, all this suddenly changes. So why it changes is because of the introduction of the horse. Um, this is one of the earliest representations of the horse that we have in our collection at the British Museum. Um, this is about 2000 BC to about 1800 BC. Um, and it shows a young man riding on the back of an animal. Now you know that this is how you ride on a donkey. You ride on a donkey back on the rump because if you've ever tried it, a donkey has very narrow shoulders and you fall off over the front if it stops suddenly. Um, so you sit well back. Also, male donkeys have very high vertebrae and it's very painful to sit up the front. So you sit on the rump. But look at the tail. The tail in this work of art, which is a, a mould for a clay plaque, the actual plaque is modern plastic, but this is the original mould. It's so important it takes up a third of the animal. And it's so important the artist has squashed the face of the animal, so you can't actually tell what it is. It looks like a dog, but believe me, it's not a dog. Um, it's a horse. That's a horse's tail. It's not a donkey's tail. Um, and this is the great revolution. He's been ridden like a donkey, because again, there's this lag in technology and in how you use these things. Um, but then when you put this animal with a vehicle and a wheel, with the two-wheeled vehicle that we saw before. Now this is a, a clay tablet with cuneiform writing, as I say, the earliest writing system in the world. And this dates from the time of a king I'm, I'm sure everyone has heard of. This is King Hammurabi. Um, so this is about 1750 BC, something like that. And you can see from the drawing of the sign on it, it's a seal has been rolled across this tablet and it has a a scene on it. There's a man standing up and he's riding in a two-wheeled chariot. He's going so fast that all the dust is being kicked up. You see above the back of the animals there, there's this twirly object. That's the sign for a dust devil. You must imagine a great cloud of dust behind this speeding vehicle. And again, this pattern evokes the idea of dust and movement and travel. Um, there are men running behind the vehicle. The man is standing up and he's whipping on the animals. And these are horses. Now, it's hard to tell, but we know they're horses because of the type of tail and the sort of tassel which appears on the harnessing system on the back. You, you nearly always get this with horses. Um, this is a revolution, literally, in terms of the wheel, and in terms of human society. This is the fast chariot. Um, this changed everything. It changed warfare, it changed transport, it changed the structure of society because you had to have horses to have chariots like this. Horses are even more expensive to keep than donkeys. They're even more sensitive, they're very fussy about what they eat. Um, they've got to be fed or they have all sorts of illnesses. Veterinary medicine is almost as old as human medicine. We have tablets like this dealing with the treatment of horses. Um, and so the need to have vehicles like this meant that society is organized in a slightly different way. And the association of the wheel and the chariot and the horse with status and power and prestige reaches a pinnacle at this time. And this important dated tablet, if you look at the wheel, well, there's two things about this wheel. It's either got spokes, it's not a solid wheel, or it has a metal tire on it, again, 
that's a change. Now, if it's a spoked wheel, this again is a technological development which goes hand in hand with going fast. You want to lighten that wheel, and it's got to be even bigger than you can make with a solid wheel, because the larger the wheel, the faster you can go. Um, so even at this time, in the Middle Bronze Age, um, the fast chariot has arrived and it's transforming society. This is a wall painting from Egypt, um, from the New Kingdom. Um, I include it here because um, there's something of a, um, a gap in the artistic record in Mesopotamia at that time, so we can fill it in a bit with material from Egypt. Um, and this is the quintessential, this is a typical fast chariot. Um, there's almost nothing there. It's made from bent poles to be as light as possible. The one at the top has horses, the one below has donkeys. The donkey doesn't go away, it's still being used, but the horse is now king. Um, I said earlier that I know that we're not very good at making these things now, we've forgotten that. We don't have this skill anymore because this is one of the ones I've helped in a little way to make. Um, I know some very talented people who have made vehicles like this. I've done some of the research and we've done television programs. If you've seen television programs which show chariots, we, we've probably been involved in some way in making them. And this was a, a typical late Bronze Age vehicle which um, uh, my colleague Robert Herford made um, for one particular television program. It, it, it's meant to be Hittite, but really it's typical. It, it could be Assyrian, it could be Babylonian of this date. They're all the same at this date. Um, and there you can see this, this is what revolutionized everything. It's the horse and this is the wheel. And you can see how light that vehicle is. Those poles you bend with steamed wood. Same way that you make furniture. Um, yet they're so strong because you tie them together with rawhide. That is untanned leather. And as untanned leather dries, it tightens. If you wrap each of those joints around the rawhide, it's almost like iron when it dries. The floor of the chariot is made from interlaced rawhide. It's incredibly strong and supple, and it's like a spring. I mean, you can drive in these at 24 miles an hour without any trouble, and you hardly feel the bounce as you go along. Um, we tried using modern webbing instead of rawhide. It doesn't work. I, this is the wonder technology of the time. And then, of course, the engine. The engine of these vehicles, the horses, you can see there. Um, the method of harnessing them has changed completely. Um, it's no longer the very simple type of harness we saw with the donkeys before. By this date, which is about 1400 BC, 1200 BC, this sort of vehicle, it's much more sophisticated. The metal bit has been invented, which the horse has in his mouth. Um, and the actual the tack and the harness is, mu is much more sophisticated as well. It used to be thought that this type of harness would choke an animal which used it. Um, we know from our experience, experiments it doesn't at all. It's get very well designed so that all the traction is borne on the neck of the animal and not on the throat at all. So it, it doesn't choke. Um, and this shows how all that power is transformed, transferred from the animal to the vehicle. This type of um, arrangement there, it, it's, it's, we call it a yoke saddle, and it sits along the shoulders of the animal, and that's where all the force of the animal is transferred. Again, all these inventions, where were they made? Was it in Iraq? Was it outside Iraq? Were they improved in Mesopotamia? We don't know. But they developed and improved and perfected in the area of these civilizations. Um, <laughs> the other thing about these vehicles is that they're very light because you need to go fast. You can carry them on your back. And this is, we're putting them in the back of a pickup here to drive from where we've been testing them. This relief is from Kosabad at the time of the Assyrian king Sargon II. They're doing exactly the same, except they don't have a pickup to put it in 
But you see, one or two men can carry these vehicles. Uh, they're astonishing. They're light, incredibly strong, and the result is this wonderful technological marvel. It's fast, and, it, and you win battles with these, basically. No army with infantry could win a battle against an army with chariots because you would be outflanked. You have to retreat to the mountains, and you have to give up the plains. This is why they're so important. And this shows um, a scene from the chariot of uh, Thutmose IV, uh, Egyptian king, and he's fighting his great enemy of the time, which is Mitanni. Um, there were Mitannian kingdoms in northern Mesopotamia, one of the most important sites for knowledge about um, this period, is uh, the site of Nusi in, in um, northern Iraq. And they showed the armor worn by these people, and again, I want to make this point, it's a mixture of inventions and technologies which makes a difference. Um, you have this fast vehicle, but animals are very vulnerable. The horse is a big target. Um, the peoples of these kingdoms are archers. They're superb archers. What do you do? Well, you invent armor, and you invent metal armor, and you cover men and horse in this armor. So you have a fast vehicle, fast armored vehicle and an armored crew. And it's the combination of all these technologies which transforms the situation. Um, it, it's uh, an astonishing thing, and if you think about the development of warfare on horseback, mounted warfare, nearly always in the Middle East you have this combination of the heavily armored rider and the horse. Because on the open plains, in this landscape, that's the type of technology and force which will succeed. And in the late Bronze Age, it's already been perfected. Now, horses were symbols of prestige and status, and so were chariots. These were gifts that kings gave one another. This is a scene showing a diplomatic gift being given from Syria to the king of Egypt. Horses and chariots. Now again, you can see, in terms of identifying where technology comes from, this is a prince giving a chariot and horse to the Egyptian king. Now if anything about these is interesting or different or better than the chariots they've got, that's going to be copied. So technology travels quickly and very widely if it's important. This tablet is from um, uh, El Amarna in Egypt. It's part of a diplomatic archive, an Egyptian diplomatic archive, but it's written in Babylonian. That's Mesopotamian language, of course, Babylon. And because that was the language of diplomacy at the time. Egyptian scribes had to know Babylonian. Um, and it's a, a letter from the king of Babylon to the king of Egypt, and in it he greets the king. Of course, when you start a letter, what do you say? Dear sir, honored sir, whatever. Um, how did they start their letters? In a similar way, my brother, king of Egypt, I hope is well. I hope all is well with you and your wives and your horses and your chariots. They're so important that they're included in the formula of greeting. Um, so I, you can't stress this enough. And then for this uh, final Egyptian scene, I always like to show these scenes in color. Ancient artworks are always brilliantly painted. Um, they love color. Of course, they had the sunlight to show this sort of color. Um, and it's nearly always been lost, but very rarely it will survive. And this Victorian drawing um, interprets the color which survived on the reliefs of Ramses II, showing the, the Battle of Kadesh. And again, you can see from this tinted, enameled armor worn by man and horse, um, this is the fighting machine which, which wins the battles. But it's not only in Egypt. Um, this object is a Kuduru of Nebuchadnezzar I. It's a boundary stealer, it's a marker. Um, it records a gift from the king to someone who's rendered a service to him. And this is decorated with symbols of the different gods, and there's a, there's a horse head symbol here, but the actual text records um, a great battle 
one by Nebuchadnezzar when he recovered the statue of Marduk and it describes in very poetic language um, the campaign for this great battle. He was known as the, the Avenger, really, of, of Babylon, Mesopotamia. Um, and it describes in poetic language how the horses and the chariots suffered on the road because it was so hot. The road burnt like a flame. But because of the services of this man, he was awarded this huge grant of land. He commanded the right-wing chariotry of, of um, King Nebuchadnezzar. Moving on quickly, because I, I say I love this subject, so I'm going on far too long, I know that, um, I will hurry up. Um, this map shows um, the kingdom of Assyria and its expansion um, from its homeland in northern Iraq, originally around the site of Ashur, but later capitals such as uh, Nimrud and Nineveh, of course, uh, modern Mosul. Um, and you can see its heartland is a solid colour right on the top. And over a period of about 200 years, 250 years, it, it conquered most of the Middle East. Um, and this is because of its mastery of a number of technologies and, and a number of skills, not least bureaucracy. Um, they had a very able administration. Um, but also because, um, of course, chariots and horses. Um, this is a, a tile um, from Ashur, uh, which was excavated at the beginning of the 20th century. Again, it's in colour, and I like to show these in colour. Um, I wish I had colour movies of Assyria to show you, sadly I don't. Um, the wheel's missing. <laughs> we'll come to that in a second. Um, but you can see the chariots changed again. The harness is different. There, we've got and another tile. I've only got this outline drawing with the wheel. The wheel's completely different now. The type of chariot has evolved because warfare has evolved. Um, one thing I want to point out here is a new discovery which you made recently. If we look at this mark on the animal's romp, then we compare it to these, these little bronze stamps, which we have in the British Museum. They're, they're from Nimrud. We used to think that they were used for stamping brick, um, but they're not. Um, I think there were brands for branding horses. And you can see that lion-shaped mark on the horse is exactly the same as those types of brands. Um, so it's an interesting detail in itself, but it reinforces this idea. See, this is royal property. These animals are important. These vehicles are important. You have to document them. You have to account for them. You have to have lists of them and their vehicles. Um, there are tablets which record surveys of vehicles and how many had bent wheels and how many had broken wheels and how many had to be repaired. You need a huge organisation to support this type of vehicle. And there's the stamp. Uh, I think it's quite a close <laughs> match, really. Um, and this is um, a relief from Nimrud. It's of the 9th century BC and it's the Assyrian king Ashurmasipal II. Um, who re-established the Assyrian Empire at that time. He was a great conqueror. Here he's shown hunting animals. And of course, what these vehicles do is that they enable you to do all these things, to excel in all these ways, which wasn't possible before. He's hunting lions. You know how dangerous lions are. And he's doing it from a chariot. Of course, he could chase after them, and you can shoot. And it's a combination of technology. You've got an advanced type of bow. There are now, have a quick count, three horses pulling this chariot. Before, you used to have two horse chariots. So again, technological adjustment. This is probably to help turning. The way chariots are used in battles probably change. You can see the vehicles loaded with weapons. It's got a spear at the back. They've got quivers with axes in them and arrows and little javelins. Um, these are multi-purpose vehicles, and the people who rode in them were the elite warriors of their time. They could fight in the vehicle, they could fight on foot, they could fight at sieges, but the vehicle gave them speed and mobility to do this. Um, I say, we've reconstructed vehicles like this. I'm afraid I, I have a movie showing how we made this, um, but... I wasn't sure I could load this, perhaps another time we can see that movie. Um, 
They're very difficult to make, and we're not sure we know exactly how these wheels are made, except this broad outer part is, is a tyre, which you would presumably take off when it got worn down, so that the wheel itself wouldn't be damaged if you ran over a rut or something like that, in the way that you would with a slightly earlier form of wheel. It has six spokes, they're made in quite a complicated way. Um, but I've got the drawing there just to show the number of parts you need just to make a wheel like that. It's, it's really technologically very advanced, very complicated. You have to master all sorts of different technologies of leather working and metal working and woodworking to make these, and we don't make them very well. Um, this again is Ashram Azapal II at Nimrud. Um, this is a scene from his throne room and he's hunting wild bulls. And a very dangerous animal to hunt. And almost nonchalantly, he's stabbing one wild bull in the back with his sword. Um, but following on behind, you can see the other great change. And something which means this great time of the wheel and the chariot is going to come to an end. And that's the ridden horse. The horse, you can see there's a man, there are two horses there, one man is guiding both of them, the other one is the king's horse behind the chariot. Earlier, in the Middle Bronze Age, there's this wonderful letter um, from Mari, where a courtier says to a king, um, if you have to ride, majesty, um, ride in a chariot or on a donkey. Don't ride on a horse, it's not fitting for a king. And that's because horses are new, you see. So older, it was the donkey that had the prestige at that time. But by the ninth century, it's fine. Kings can ride horses. And why this is important, well, chariots couldn't do everything. Um, this relief of Ashanas Park shows him conquering mountains, this mountainous terrain. It shows that really he can go anywhere, he can do anything. But the texts explain in greater detail, actually, when the mountains were too steep and the way was too severe, he went on foot. You couldn't take the chariots with you. You could cut roads. The Assyrians cut roads through solid rock with bronze picks when they had to, but obviously it's not ideal. So what do you do? Well, you leave the chariots behind and you ride the horses. And this is part of a, a, a bronze band from gates from a place called Balawat. Um, these came from the gates of the temple. They were found in the 1950s um, uh, by Max Malowan. Um, they were on display in Mosul Museum. I'm not sure what Agatha Christie's husband. That's it. Yes, yes, Agatha <laughs> Christie. And you see, you have the king still in his chariot, but everybody else is riding horses. They're cavalry, and they're fighting people in mountains. So this is the beginning of this type of rider taking over. But what is it to begin with? It's as if they're charioteers, but they don't have a chariot. It's two men and two horses, and they're riding together, but the vehicle's not there. Because again, they're so wedded to the idea of this vehicle, which has ruled the battlefield at this time for nearly 2,000 years. Uh, and this is when Riding horses become important. The Assyrians import horses very widely. Um, these are coming from, this is an ivory showing horses being brought as a gift to the king of Assyria. Um, but the horses even imported, the Assyrians even imported horses from Egypt, from Nubia, for their chariots. Wheels were used for other things than chariots. This great engine here, siege engine, battering down the walls of this city, you see it's on wheels. Um, the thing itself is made to look like an elephant, and you can see the battering grounds are like two tusks. But it was fabricated by the Assyrians on the battlefield, and they're using chariot parts and, and wheels. So this is the other things wheels used for. And then finally, it's like wrong, so very far over time, what is the, the, the peak of chariot development in Mesopotamia? It's this type of vehicle. This is King Ashurbanipal, the last great Assyrian king. Um, this is about 650 BC, this relief. He's hunting lions. Um, in terms of work of art, these are the peak of Assyrian art. Um, 
And you can see how the vehicle has changed again. There's this enormous wheel. It must want to go very fast. Um, there are four people in it. It's a crew of four. And you'll have to take my trust for this. There are four horses pulling it as well. So the chariot's now huge, but they're still going just as fast. They're still associated with kings and with monarchy. Um, the wheels are made in a completely different way, with a different technology. Um, we found the parts of this type of wheel very widely. We found them in, in Turkey, um, and we found them in Europe. Uh, we found wheels of this type um, on the Danube um, at Halstatt. And it's the typical type of Iron Age wheel, um, of the European Iron Age. Now this doesn't mean Assyrian chariots, but it meant that this technology and this way of making wheels is over a huge area. Um, and it shows the influence of these settled civilizations over all the lands around them at this time. Um, and then what does the scene show? It shows the king in his religious aspect, defeating evil, the lion standing for evil in this case, and they're powerless against him in his chariot at speed. We have them in paintings as well. This is from an Assyrian palace uh, at uh, Tilbasip in Syria. We, there's technological development with other parts of the vehicle. This is the type of um, yoke, and you can see it's the four horses. Um, were these objects real? Well, we found examples of all the types of harness shown on the reliefs and excavations. These are types of blinker and bell and frontlet that are shown on these reliefs and we exactly the same type of object we found at Nineveh and, and in Rood. And these little shell buttons, these were decorated harness on horses. We found hundreds and hundreds of them. There must have been thousands, tens of thousands, because every horse must have had hundreds of these. The what site... What are they made of, sorry? What are they made of? Uh, shell. Some are stone, some are shell. The ones at the bottom are bronze. They're, they're made of all sorts of different materials. Presumably the king's it was of gold, but we, we don't have those. Um, and then, in the succeeding period, the time of the um, Achaemenid Persian kings, we can see that actually it is still that type of vehicle. Um, this is from the Oxus treasure, um, um, probably from Tajikistan, but it shows pretty much the same sort of vehicle with this large wheel. Um, this is from a rock carving in Arabia, and it shows, again, pretty much this sort of vehicle. This is probably Babylonian, Neo-Babylonian influence at the time of um, Nebuchadnezzar or Nabonidus, more likely. And what made all this possible? What made all this possible? Well, it's the wheel, and it's a combination of the wheel with all these other technologies. And of course, it's the imagination and the inventiveness of the people who have these technologies and put them together, um, which made this such an engine of development of early civilization. And I end on this slide because here we see the lion in desperation. What is he doing? He's grabbing the wheel of the chariot. He's biting it. It's almost as if he knows that is what is making him powerless. And that is the reason for his defeat. That's a romantic view anyway. Thank you. for a very interesting talk. So when the British people nowadays joke or comment about are we reinventing the wheel, they have the right to do so. What it, do you think? We, we're doing it all the time. And uh, <laughs> this, is, this is true. And as I was saying about how good this early technology was, um, rawhide is the perfect material for the job and nothing we've got will, is better than it for doing what it was used for. Um, so, yeah, I, we think we're very clever.
Um, it's very curious, I mean, when they made these wheels, how did they stick them together? You mentioned nails. What are these nails made of? So, of course, they're, they're made of a great variety of materials, and all these components change over time as they're improved. Um, they're made of bronze and they're made of iron. Um, a, a single wheel would have had uh, bronze and iron fittings, it would have had rawhide leather, um, it would have used different types of wood, it would have used specific wood chosen for its strength or chosen for its pliability because it could be bent, it could be heat bent. Um, some tablets at different times do go into this, they do talk about wheel construction but not in enough detail unfortunately. Um, but when talking about other things such as the harness of the animals, they'll use say goat leather for a certain part and ox hide for another part. Um, so they knew materials, material science and technology was very advanced and they, they knew what to use and where. And this material they were imported. You know, southern Iraq, it doesn't have stone. It doesn't have metal. You know, these all had to be imported to, to make these things. Um, and so these raw materials are being imported very great distances to make these high technology items. And what's traded in exchange is usually textiles. So, um, so that, but they don't survive. So we find the metal and we find the stone now in Iraq and other places, but we don't find the Babylonian and the Syrian textiles because they've gone. With time, they go deteriorate. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, most enjoyable lecture with excellent documentation. Um, I have just a few comments. Uh, first of all, did you have this in a book? available in the British Museum or wherever? Um, not the specific subject, but we, we have many of these pictures. Um, there are a couple, there's a book on Assyrian sculpture which we have, and there are postcards as well, and there's a little book called Mesopotamia, which will have a lot of these reliefs in. It's by Julian Reed? Yes, by Julian Reed. And, yeah. I mean, I have written uh, one or two <laughs> things on sort of chariots and wheels, but I mean, I really need to get together with my colleagues and write up our experiments with well, vehicles. The, the reason I'm asking you, yeah. uh, because I have visited Julia Reed myself, and we have a long discussion, me and him. Yeah. And uh, at the end, I just told him that there is a, I mean, the British Museum is an international establishment which serves scientific progress of history everywhere in the world. Mesopotamia stands very sort of highly among all civilizations. It is the cradle of civilization. I mean, if you, if you read the history, there are about sort of 11 civilizations. Five of them are in Mesopotamia alone. Uh, Mesopotamia, of course, uh, Sa Samu Nur uh, Promer has written a very nice book about history begins at some point oh, yeah. with 39 achievements, first achievements in the world. And one of, this, one of them is this. Um, the wheel itself and the chariot, uh, wheel chariot, um, Though it is very important, and we cannot really imagine a civilization now without a, 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 chariot, a chariot transport, Maya, Aztec, and Inca don't have the wheel, yet they have civilization. And I think one of the crucial factors for their defeat before the Spaniards is the horse and the probably chariot. Yeah, exactly. you know, this is one of them. Yeah. And this is probably nice to be put. There. And I noticed also one of your interesting, you know, sort of slides. You showed that uh, this is from Egypt because you have to patch it because there is nothing in the Mesopotamia. I just want to compliment that that Egypt was part of a Syrian empire at that time. So uh, Egypt as well as Syria was part of us, part of Mesopotamia. Well, the Assyrians were importing horses from Nubia, which yes. was it on the borders of Egypt, so even further, and that's, I, the influence of Assyria went far, far beyond the borders. Yes. Um, and you can see this from Phoenician, that they're exporting Assyrian as well. I mean, the influence of Assyria on archaic Greek art, you know, that's a subject to be studied, yet to be studied, I think, and it was obviously very important. I mean, I look forward to your excellent lecture, trans translated practically into a book, available in the British Museum, because I, I honestly, I do feel 
and I'm very serious about that, I feel there is underrepresentation, tremendous underrepresentation of Mesopotamian civilization in the British Museum. So there's a lot of talk and hoo ha about Egyptian and Egyptology, and yet when I went there, I found only two books by Julia Reed, and probably they came at a fruitful outcome because of my discussion with him. They are just very sort of orphan books, you know, about the Mesopotamia. And I do feel that this, this will be notable. Well, we, I think most of, our, most of our, the Department of the Middle East's effort has been going into special exhibitions recently. So, for example, I've done three exhibitions in the last few years, yeah. and, you know, it's a lot of effort. So, so yes, it, it's true. I think, yeah, we, we'll focus more upon our... Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Faluji, for a passionate discussion. <laughs> yes, please.